In a previous video similar metaphoric opening, I talked about the amazing tricks that a certain legend once upon a time did in a circus, that his peers and audiences were so impressed that they ended up trying to recreate them with varying results. The legend naturally was not pleased about how his tricks were recreated, and has to this day... Alan Moore has vocally been against his stories being used by DC Comics without giving the control of his own creations back to him. However, Moore does allegedly have a soft spot for the Justice League Unlimited cartoons adaptation of his story that was written in the 11th annual issue of Superman's monthly comic book in 1985. For the man who has everything, which was still set during the pre-crisis era because Crisis on Infinite Earths, which had also started in 1985, had not yet reached that point where its reboot happened. It is a rather short and emotionally personal story for Superman said during his birthday, which according to the second page's opening can only be celebrated only once in four years, because it takes place during a leap year on February 29. Also, in the spirit of the Jason Todd trilogy I did last year, this story happens to be one of those few stories where Jason Todd is the Robin accompanying Batman. But since this is the pre-crisis, he is more than likely that Dick Grayson clone who grew up in the circus with dyed hair, rather than a former street urchin. Fun fact by the way, For the Man Who Has Everything was written while Alan Moore was still working with Dave Gibbons on planning out how to do Watchmen. And it was first Gibbons who was asked by his editor Julius Schwartz if he could draw a Superman story. To which agreeing to be available then requested more to write it when Schwartz gave him the go ahead for it. Here are the obligatory time codes for those of you who can't watch these videos in one go. And now let's get to the story. The story opens with a third-person narrated prologue, where an overworked family man is coming home in a futuristic alien world, and is greeted with a surprise party by his family. This lifts his spirits from the earlier weariness, as the man is content to have his family being all about him. In the real world, Wonder Woman and Batman have raced to the Fortress of Solitude on their aerial vehicles, where the invisible jet has ended up leaving the Batplane eating dust. After Batman has introduced Jason Todd as the new Robin to Wonder Woman, they move to enter the fortress as Superman seems to have left the door open in waiting for them. Today on February 29th is Superman's birthday, so they are there on a social call, which is also Jason's first time visiting the place, with Wonder Woman not telling what she has brought as her present in fear of Superman hearing her with his super hearing, while Batman showcases a new strain of rose bred by a horticulturalist he has paid for and has been named as Krypton. While Bruce dryly comments about having gotten Superman flowers, Jason shockingly asks if he kept the receipt to get something else, as they find Superman standing comatose and with an alien plant rooted onto his chest. Moving in to inspect his condition, Wonder Woman tells Batman that Superman is still breathing, and while Robin collects the evidence suggesting that the alien plant was sent as a gift, Batman concludes that Superman is in a world of his own, as his eyes are not responding to light stimuli. In this dream world, Melancholy Kal El is approached by his wife Lila about his father Jor El not having attended his birthday party, due to him not wanting to face Kara and Allura after Zor El's death. Before going to bed, Kal decides to go see his father the next day, where he is received by a bitter Jor El, who is also visited by the mayor Dux R and Reverend Lor M. After they leave, Jor El excuses them for having kept him from attending Carl's birthday due to the rally they were planning. As he does not even appear to be sorry, Carl attempts to question why his father is this into the political struggles, which Jor El then answers by pointing at the Krypton around them and ranting about having been wrong about Krypton's destruction has snowballed to the point where the Science Council is campaigning to release criminals from the Phantom Zone. 
This caused the skull to conclude that his father must be wishing that Krypton had exploded, and leaves the bitter old man alone in his glass garden. In the reality, Batman, Robin and Wonder Woman inspecting Superman's current situation are confronted by Mongul. Teleported here from some alien culture, some grateful world. Or someone wanting you to think they were grateful. How remarkable. You animals really are almost intelligent, aren't you? That's exactly what happened who maliciously confesses that he sent the alien plant to Superman, and explains it being a telepathic plant slash fungi called Black Mercy. When attached to its victims, the Black Mercy forms a symbiosis in feeding from their bio-aura, and as a telepath reads them like an open book to create a logical simulation of the happy endings their hearts desire. Superman could shrug it off, but he clearly doesn't want to. I wonder where he thinks he is, sitting on a throne ruling the universe, all you human garbage fawning at his feet. More honest, don't you think, than this pretense of being a selfless hero? Done with his educational lecture, Mongul then turns to Batman, Robin and Wonder Woman, and in a mocking way of trying to showcase chivalry, asks which one of them would be polite to be killed first. Wonder Woman being acknowledged as the strongest among them, then moves to throw the first punch, but Mongul quickly shrugs it off. In the dream world, Kal arrives to a hospital to meet his aunt Allura, who was left to look after his son Van, and is told by her that his cousin Kara was attacked by rioters who left her in a critical condition. The rioters left a flyer on Kara to identify them as anti-Phantom Zone campaigners, who hold a grudge against the House of El for Jor-El having created the Phantom Zone, and Kara is so their latest victim. After having seen her, Kal calls Lila about Kara's situation, and tells her they need to go visit her family for the safety of their children. Kara and Allura will be safe in the hospital, while Lila and their daughter Orna can take a straight paragondola, and Kal will drive himself with Van to Atomic Town on their floater car. On their way there, Kal and Van come across that rally for Sword of Rao that Jor-El was asked to attend earlier, and which Kala tries to desperately explain to Van as a circus ballet. In the real world, Mongul throws Wonder Woman to the armory while coming across as a Super Wonder Shipper, and Wonder Woman looks for a weapon to even out the odds. Oh dear, is that a neural impactor? I didn't know they were still making those. I'd advise you to try the plasma disruptor. It's more of a woman's weapon. Go, Chief. Mongul still manages to tank Wonder Woman's attack, and hearing her struggles makes Batman to start calling out to Superman to wake up so he can go help Wonder Woman. Back in the dream world, Kala sees his father Jor-El being introduced as the chairman for Sword of Rao, and pretty much talking about how Krypton is not great anymore. The anti-Phantom Zone people yell back at Jor-El about him being a false prophet who claimed that Krypton would have blown up in the past, which leads to a riot between the two political parties that Kal recognizes that they need to get away from. Than is worried and asks about his grandfather having shouted about the world ending, to which Kal responds while driving away that Jor-El's world ended decades ago. They drive out to the crater left in Kandor's place when it was taken by Brainiac, and where Kal, while trying to comfort his son... Van, when you were born, it was the happiest day of my life. When I first saw your beautiful little face, your tiny fingers squeezed my hand so tight, like you never wanted to let go. I've watched every step, every struggle. I've... But Van, I... Rao, help me. But I don't think you're real. I don't think any of this is real. 
At the same time in the real world, Batman is starting to pull the Black Mercy off from Superman, but not using the gauntlets that Mongul left behind and Robin is presenting to him. Black Mercy attaches itself onto him next, as Superman's dream ends with him being pulled away from his frightened son and wakes up. While Batman dreams about his father fighting off Joe Shill trying to mug them, Robin sees Superman having woken up very much pissed off. And after having been told by Robin that Mongol did this, Superman charges at the one-sided fight between him and Wonder Woman, in a visual showcasing of what faster than a speeding bullet and more powerful than a locomotive looks like. Do you have any idea what you did to me? I fashioned a prison that you couldn't leave without sacrificing your heart's desire. It must have been like tearing off your own arm. By the time Superman has started to confront Mongo for what he did, Robin, having seen what happened to Batman, decides to use Mongo's gauntlet to try and succeed in pulling the Black Mercy from Batman's chest. Happy birthday, Kryptonian. I give you oblivion. Burn! This following part of the story is then of Superman and Mongo fighting each other throughout the Fortress of Solitude, as Robin tries to keep up with them, until they reach the floor below him and Superman briefly freezes in seeing the statues of his Kryptonian parents. You should have stayed in whatever happy fantasy the Black Mercy granted you. Happy? Do you know what I've lost? What I... You know, for a moment there, I almost believed you were gonna kill me. How stupid of you to hesitate like that. Not a mistake I'll make, I can assure you. But I think this is yours. At this point, Robin has made it to a vantage point where he can literally get a drop on Mongul, and so drop the Black Mercy onto him to make Mongul dream of the following circumstances differently than how they actually do end up going. Later, as Mongul has been pacified and Batman is helped to recover from his Black Mercy experience, in which he says that he grew up to marry the Silver Age Batwoman Kathy Kane and had a daughter with her, it's finally the time to give Superman his birthday presents. Wonder Woman got him a Femuskira made replica of the bottle city of Kandor, in believing that Superman has already restored the original to its original size, and Superman not want to come across ungrateful, uses his pre-crisis speed to hide the still miniaturized Kandor in probably one second. Then thanking Diana for the gift, they both give the Super Wonder Shipper something to cheer at. YES! Batman's present unfortunately got stepped on, and the new breed of Krypton Rose is now dead. Superman does not hold it against Batman, and then asks him, Robin and Wonder Woman, if they want coffee, not cake, while he cleans up the fortress. The story then ends with an epilogue, showing how Mongo's dream has him dominate the known universe with the war world, and like Superman in the opening prologue, being content with it. Okay, as a pre-crisis story done in the 80s, that really shows in certain aspects like how the Fortress of Solitude has a giant key, Superman is on a flash level of fast, and the tone is pretty much similar as with Watchmen, which shouldn't be a surprise with both Moore and Gibbons working on it. Also, Superman's wife, Laila Lerrol, in his fantasy was apparently an existing character from a previous Silver Age Superman story, who along with Kathy Kane, whom Batman says he married in his Black Mercy dream, were apparently one of Alan Moore's favorite characters. Moore is apparently also that much of a Super Wonder Shipper, that he was the one who made Superman and Wonder Woman kiss at the end, while Batman and Robin acted like it was normal. Researching one of my current projects has revealed that Alan Moore is one of Jared's people, aka Super Wonder Shipper. Yes! 
I'll take it! Then, since the 1980s was when DC was going from the Bronze Age towards the Modern Age, this tone similar to Watchmen is clear for everyone to see in how much of a sexist Mongol is towards Wonder Woman, besides just being a more stronger opponent beating her up. But then there was also the portrayal of Krypton in Superman's Black Mercy Dream, which instead of being the perfect dream Mongol described it to be, was just good enough to make him content. From another point of view, you could say that Superman's dream on Krypton was portrayed as it was because his own mind was fighting against the Black Mercy, and he was strong enough to see through the charade when Batman started to pull the Black Mercy off him. Also, in knowing what kind of writer Alan Moore is, the political undertones in here were also a giveth with how Jor-El's bitter characterization and being a member of the Sword of Rao being a shot at Ronald Reagan, the sitting president of the United States at the time. It was Reagan's presidency that originally inspired Senator Armstrong to say, I'll make America great again! in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, which by the way came out in 2013. Then, other than raising Mongo's profile and making him to be seen as a serious Superman villain, I don't know what else to say about the comic anymore that I wouldn't be repeating when talking about the episode adaptation. So I might as well rewatch it now so I can gather my thoughts about it. Let's start by commenting how Robin is not present with Batman and Wonder Woman while they visit Superman in the Fortress of Solitude. Apparently, besides the Bat embargo being a thing, most of the production team on Justice League Unlimited, led by Bruce Team, was ready and willing to cut Robin out of the story, with only Dwayne McDuffie wanting to keep Robin in. Then again, Jason Todd was never established to in the DCAU where the GLU is set in. But Tim Drake was still an underused character from the new Batman Adventures cartoon. Also, Superman's daughter Orna is cut out, probably because she didn't have much screen time in the comic, so Van El is made to be an only child. Also, the darker aspects from the comic, such as the political allusions and Mongol's sexism towards Wonder Woman, are either cut out or toned down. In the case of the former, Jor-El is not portrayed as a bitter old man whose reputation was broken in Superman's Black Mercy Dream, but rather as a cautiously chill old man who has managed to rebuild his broken reputation. A lot of other characters are also cut like Supergirl, who was established in the DCAU, but not as a blood relative of Superman, so that is probably why she and her aunt Allura were also cut. Speaking of Supergirl, actually, in his book Alan Moore's Writing for Comics, Moore supposedly has stated that Supergirl was originally supposed to be in the original story in Wonder Woman's place, but Julius Schwartz denied him from using her because of what was going to happen to Supergirl not soon after it in Crisis on Infinite Earths. That being said, I think Supergirl could have been substituted into the episode in Robin's place, at the very least so that Batman would have been speaking with her while Wonder Woman was fighting Mongol, instead of talking to himself, but hey, that is just my opinion coming in two decades too late. Then Brainiac was turned into Keelex and General Zard, who never appeared in any of the DCAU's animated series, is mentioned to be a little boy. Little Zard's party isn't till next. I told you I didn't want a surprise party. 
Laila Lelron is also replaced with a hybrid character of Lois Lane with Lana Lang's hair, and who is voiced by Lois's DCAU voice actor Donna Delaney. Oh please, I couldn't get you off this farm if I exploded a quantum bomb under your... And where as the censors of this kid show thought that the political aspects were too much, they clearly wanted to compensate with a few frames of Superman's marital bliss with her. Then the lack of those political aspects, like that rally with the Sword of Rao and the anti-Phantom Zone campaigners, have been more or less replaced with tremors that lead to Krypton exploding in Superman's dream before Black Mercy is pulled off him. And as I showcase in using the voice lines in the story commentary, George Newburn's performance does all the justice to Superman's dialogue in that scene. Also, the writer of the episode, J.M. Demates, has said that he doesn't really see Superman being happier on Krypton than on Earth, but rather having a longing to experience life on Krypton that he was denied of. Then, in going to the reality outside of Superman's Black Mercy dream, Wonder Woman is now giving Superman that new breed of rose called Krypton instead of Batman, who instead is giving him a check of cash that probably makes Clark Kent's yearly reporter salary look like pocket change. Mongul, while magnificently voiced by Eric Roberts to sell what kind of villain he was in the comic, somehow feels like he has shrunk to be smaller than in the comic and one digit less threatening, likely to make sure that Wonder Woman could be durable enough to pull a double duty with what she did in the comic and with what Robin did in the comic. That means that the gauntlets that Mongul had in the comic to safely handle the Black Mercy are cut out for some reason, and when Wonder Woman is pulling it off from Batman, it just doesn't latch onto her like how it did onto Batman when he pulled it off from Superman. Should I call this a plot armor change? Because it doesn't register to me as a story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story change. In this sense, it would have been better to have Supergirl to pick up the slack in pulling the Black Mercy off from Batman with the gauntlets and throw it at Mongol while he is fighting Superman. Finally, I should probably acknowledge some other cut corners, like how Batman's Black Mercy dream is stuck with Thomas Wayne beating up Joe Shill, who never drops his gun, which suggests that unlike the pre-crisis Batman, the DCAU Batman is unable to imagine a life for himself with his parents alive. And then for obvious censorship reasons, Mongol's Black Mercy dream is cut out in the end, and substituted with audio suggesting that the same thing is happening in his head, but we can only hear and imagine what it is based on the sounds. Okay, let's summarize. The adaptation came out 19 years after the comic in 2004, and thanks to the bat embargo, Robin, be it Jason Todd, or Tim Drake, who had been established in the DCAU, ended up getting cut. There could have been a chance to replace him with Supergirl, but it never happened, so Mongul ended up getting nerfed, so that Wonder Woman could have the endurance for double duty Robin's role too. Obviously, Mongul's sexist attitude had to be toned down, because the Justice League Unlimited was primarily aimed at 7 year olds, so the violence between his and Wonder Woman's fighting was also edited, while Superman's dream had to also be overhauled to remove political allusions out of it. Even then, while the Black Mercy was used to frame Superman as if his harsh desire was to have lived on Krypton, J.M. Demate's point of view in seeing it as a longing to experience something Superman never got to have, still manages to have it as a framing device to what Clark Kent desires in his heart, to have a chance to be normal and have a family, like the Kents were in raising him. The fact that Jor-El's voice actor suddenly switches from Christopher McDonald to Mike Farrell, who voiced Parkins in the DCAU. Go on up with your father, Van. I'll be along in a few minutes. The voice actor changed in there. Seemed to acknowledge that, along with having Superman be a farmer in the episode's version of the Black Mercy dream, whereas in the comic, 
Kal El was implied to have the same job as Randy Mars before Tegrity hit him. In the outside world, I am a simple geologist, but in here, I am Falcorn, defender of the Alliance. That also brings us back to the argument I made in my Superman vs. the Elite video about dreams and fantasies. Dreams can come true if you balance your ideals with what kind of world you have around yourself. Because that way you can work your way into making them reality. But if you cannot do that, then your dream is really just a fantasy and you need to WAKE THE FUCK UP! Which is what Superman then had to do in both versions of the story. And just like in Superman vs the Elite, George Newbern deserves more recognition for his vocal performance as Superman in animated properties. With how he again managed to read dialogue that showcases the weight Superman has on his shoulder. Seriously, that man should be recognized as THE Superman voice, the same way how Kevin Conroy is seen as THE Batman voice. Wow, well, help me. But I don't think you're real. I don't think any of this is, is real. Don't say that, Daddy. Please, you're scaring me. No, no. I don't want to scare you, Van. You are everything I ever wanted in a son. This... This is everything I ever wanted in my life. But I've got responsibilities, Van. And I have to go now. I promise you, I'll never forget. And that, even with all those differences made to the rest of the story, now makes me understand why Alan Moore has stated this episode to be the only adaptation of his work that he has liked enough to let his name be on the credits. I don't think I need to say more than that anymore. Okay, Death of Superman and its follow-ups are going to be the next comparison reviews while we wait for Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 2 to come out. Remember to like this video, Comment what you would find worth saying about both the comic and the episode adapting it. Share this video for more people to see and subscribe for those following videos. Also, as I have now moved to my new apartment, ding the bell for when I have set up everything in the background of my webcam to stream video games and may your heart be your guiding key.